So I am President and CEO of the National Co-op Business Association, CLUSA. This year we are celebrating our 100th anniversary. Yay! Our mission is to promote, advance, and protect uh, cooperatives. Our members represent all types of cooperatives. Uh, housing co-ops from New York City, uh, rural utilities like we are here today at the offices of CFC. We represent credit unions, uh, national food cooperatives, and hopefully in the future a lot of home care worker co-ops. So. In 1944, NCBA Inclusive created something called the Freedom Fund. Um, it was, its purpose uh, became to establish CARE. Now, a lot of you know CARE as the boxes that were sent overseas, but in 1944, CARE stood for Cooperative Americans for Remittance in Europe, and we sent money over first. That Freedom Fund became the Cooperative Development Foundation, which is your host and organizer of the conference today, headed by Executive Director Leslie Mead. Over the years, NCBA CLUSA, because we have such a diverse membership, we're not strictly a trade association for one type of cooperative, we pull together coalitions and we generally lobby to create resources for cooperatives. We did that uh, in USAID, which is the Agency for International Development, uh, Overseas Cooperative Development, of which NCBA CLUSA manages about $42 million, and we do development overseas. Uh, we helped to pull a coalition together, which created the National Consumer Cooperative Bank, your sponsor for the dinner last night. Um, and uh, we spent a lot of time lobbying for something called the World Cooperative Development Grant Program, housed at USDA. And it is that grant that CDF is able to host you and other centers working with the home care co-op. So that's what NCBA does. We're happy to be here and uh, please, because uh, you're being hosted by CFC, that represents the sixth principle of cooperatives. I'm sure you all know the seven principles of cooperatives and what our, we do our business on. But the sixth principle is cooperation among cooperatives. And so here today we have the National Co-op Business Association working with CDF, hosted by CFC, which is the Cooperative Finance Corporation that is the financing arm of the rural electric cooperatives. Um, we've been hosted last night by the National Co-op uh, Bank and the Capital Impact Partners, which is a development entity. And uh, we're here delighted because uh, we're hoping that the home care co-op sector becomes a huge sector in the U.S. economy, and you're the pioneers, and we look forward to seeing you on an annual basis. So thank you for coming, making the trip, and all your good work. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Leslie. Terrific. Uh, Judy gave a lot of my speech, so I uh, had to cut it short. Um, it's, I'm delighted to have you all here today. We. Um, have been planning this meeting for about two years. Um, I want to give you a little background about CDF and our interest in home care cooperatives. Um, CDF has worked um, with home care cooperatives for uh, a number of years, um, but for the last three years, we've hosted a group of uh, co-op developers that we call the Development Steering Committee. And those folks, um, get together monthly by phone, sometimes in person, to talk about issues in their development of cooperatives and bigger picture issues about um, uh, how to scale uh, co-op uh, home care development. And I'd like to introduce some of the people um, on that committee because they're really responsible for, uh, the, I, I think that this, this conference is a culmination of the work of um, that development steering committee. So, um, Margaret Bow from USDA. Margaret, can you explain? Deborah. Oh, yeah. And Diane Gasloy with the Northwest Property Development Center. And I'd like to say that in the Northwest, they've developed three. Uh, uh, home care co-ops in Washington State. You have 
maybe two more in the works. So that is really cool when we look at thinking about how we network and collaborate among home care cooperatives to have um, a, a, a cluster of them in the state is, is really um, uh, what we're striving for, and I think it, it's a tribute to uh, Deborah and Diane's terrific work. So, um, Kevin Edward from Cooperative Development Services, Dave Hammer and Margaret Lund. Um, Dave is with the ICA group doing um, really great research in this area and uh, with Margaret, uh, with uh, Waperco. And then, um, is Allison Powers here from um, Capital Impact Partners? Not yet. Uh, and, um, and then Ann Reynolds with the uh, University of Wisconsin Center. <laughs> um, Judy's, th this development steering committee, I would love to take credit for it, but it was Judy's view on Sunset Brain Child, so Judy deserves the credit. And um, I would also like to take credit for the idea that of home care cooperatives, but um, I can't do that either. But I would like to, to recognize Liz Bailey because the Cooperative Development Foundation works in this area because of Liz Bailey. And this meeting is really a, a part of Liz's legacy. So Liz. <laughs> so what do we want to do here? Um, what is it, the CDFs? goal in home care cooperative development. It's to create sustainable home care cooperatives that optimize wages and opportunities for member owners. We seek to develop cooperatives that um, are strong businesses run by competent managers and governed by empowered boards, informed and empowered boards. Businesses that are employers of choice for home care providers and um, agencies of choice for the people needing their services. Uh, businesses that attract and retain staff through competitive wages, quality training, and career advancement opportunities. Those are our goals. As we see, you know, as we talk about this today, you see these, some of these are aspirational, but I think this is what we want to strive for. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the other people that are in this room. We have eight of the nine home care cooperatives currently in operation in the United States. There are five organizational, uh, five groups in an organizational stage here today. There are technical assistance providers who have um, worked with uh, developing home care cooperatives. There are lenders who understand cooperatives and uh, cooperative de development. And then there are government and nonprofit organizations. So you will have missed an opportunity if you attend this meeting and don't go home and know these folks. Because these are people who are going to be important in your cooperative role in developing it and as it moves forward. Uh, so I have uh, three goals for this conference. One is networking, as I just said. Go home with a list of contacts that you feel comfortable that you can call because these folks are happy to talk to you. Second, education. I hope that each of us learns something that um, impacts our approach to managing the cooperative, developing the cooperative, um, governing the cooperative. And finally, collaboration. And as Judy said, um, it, it is important that as small home care businesses, which most of you are, that you work together. Because that's the way that you'll survive. So um, collaboration is, is key to what we want you to think about when you go home from here. So um, Judy recognized uh, most of our sponsors. And um, a couple that uh, she missed is one is uh, the CHS, um, Cooperative. It's the largest cooperative in the United Agricultural Cooperative in the United States. CHS provided uh, its foundation provided scholarship funding for many of you to attend this event. Um, also, 
tonight, Capital Impact Partners, which is a CDFI and Cooperative Development Financial Institution, <coughs> pardon me, um, is sponsoring the dinner tonight. And the tour is sponsored by CoBank, which is a cooperative bank. So that is what I had to say. I've got a few housekeeping um, items. Uh, Cassie Duran, Cassie, are you in here? Cassie Duran and Ellen Quinn are with the CDF staff. If you have any questions, talk to one of the three of us and we're happy to, to help you out. Um, the breaks are in the folder where you came in. There's a map of the CFC facility on the first page of your program and the restrooms are indicated on that map. Um, this event is being taped, there's a videotape and uh, it'll be posted on the CDF website. So um, if there are things that you'd like other board members to just view, you'll have access to that after the meeting. We are also doing some interviews in the multi-purpose room, which is out to the left and then kind of behind the stairs as you came in. Um, we're taping uh, participants at the conference uh, to get the reaction both to the conference and uh, to talk a little bit about the cooperative and hopefully we can use that, that material for marketing purposes and make it generally available to, to you all if you want to use it um, in marketing. So, John? Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, we're going to start off with the cooperative home care, Tracy Brzezinski and Becky Cohen. So I'm just going to run over it. You're going to have to follow me around a bit. <laughs> um, so, my name is Tracy Brzezinski. I've been with cooperative care since 2006. And I'm Rebecca Taylor. I'm in cooperative care since 2008. So we're going to go a little time traveling. A long time ago, about 15 years, in a land far away, <laughs> and in central Wisconsin, or very rural, in Washer County, um, there were two recipe boxes at social services. Um, one contained recipe cards with the names of the caregivers in the county. One contained the recipe cards with the name of the people that needed service. So someone at social services would match those up. And it was working fine, you know. They were being paid minimum wage and weren't getting any benefits. It was working well for the county, but not so much for the workers. Uh, there was some lawsuit in the state of Wisconsin. Um, and then the county got to thinking, oh boy, we're kind of going to be on the hook. Who's the employer? Is it us? Is it the clients? So the director of social services at the time, Lou Rowley, heard about the co-op in France and wondered why can't it work here? Um, very forward-thinking woman, uh, got a group of people together. They did got a grant from the state of Wisconsin to do business planning and all that kind of stuff. And um, we'll fast forward 15 years. We've been in business since June, uh, June 1st, 2001. Um, and we've had our ups and downs. Um, we've worked together as a group, and we're still in business and successful for the most part. Um, and Becky's going to tell you a little bit more about our business. Um, we currently have about 50 employees. Uh, about 40 of them are member owners. They don't want to do the number owner aspect of it. Um, serving about 175 clients, uh, about 1,000 service hours a week um, in seven clients. Mm -hmm. So a uh, lot goes into the scheduling and all that stuff, and that's, that's what I do as a team leader, um, the scheduling and the, the management part of it for the caregivers. Um, about 85% of our clients currently are uh, fund clients. Through our family care program in Wisconsin, and um, the rest are uh, private pay, or 
And what we really want to learn from this conference is, like, from you guys, how you do private A, how, because kind of we're making a conscious effort in our strategic plan to move forward to switch more to private pay and rely less on government funding because that's not a real good way for us to raise. So. Okay. I'd say I have a special connection with property care because 11 years ago, Ann Reynolds asked me to come up and work with their board. And it was the first time I had stepped out of my co-op to have another co-op. And I decided I really liked it. And so here I am today. <laughs> I transitioned into development of uh, the president. So I was really fun working with uh, these folks. Next up, we have Golden Steps with Angelina uh, Cazares. I'll wear that. Do you want to fill that in here?
month of operation um, with a population of 15,000. We serve our elders about 750 hours. Whoa. And um, we're going to be up over 800 hours in September. Um, we ride on the wave of community support. Our community needs us and loves us. Our um, medical, our hospital and general medical services are publicly owned in our county. And we are the only home care agency that they refer now to their patients. <laughs> My associates at our competitors, although they're not really competitors, uh, we have two other agencies in town, three other agencies in town. Two of them are no longer getting private pay clients. They're all on state. We've taken all of their private pay clients. <laughs> <laughs> and most of their good caregivers. <laughs> the other large home instead, huge multinational organization has felt um, our presence as well. Their numbers are down, so as a result, they are low, ha, raising their prices for their services in order to you know, get their good corporate profit. So anyway, we're having an act of great love in our community. It's great to be here. Thank you. Um, I don't have a name, but uh, it's the Western North Carolina Home Care Proposition. Is anyone in the room with that organization? Hi there. Hi there. Hi there. I think I know I'm on here. Is there anyone else here? Um, I didn't know I was going to be on here. But, um, <laughs> That's okay. uh, We're all friendly. <laughs> Uh, I'm Jane Hatley, I'm with Self-Help Credit Union, and this is not a self-help initiative uh, yet, I hope it will be, but uh, basically there's a group of us in Western North Carolina that are hoping to start a, a home care uh, cooperative. So we are basically at the very earliest stage, and that's about all I have to report, except there's big community support for it. Wonderful, let's uh, give them all a good There will be two more of these uh, breakouts to learn about the different co-ops, and I'll head back now to listen. And we're ahead of schedule. Yeah, <laughs> so um, they, uh, Rebecca Kohler is going to introduce shift, there's always a risk that it gets awful for people. And there's a real risk that the demographic shift in the United States is going to create poverty for millions and millions of home care workers. And the people in this room, you are the bulwark against that. Right? There are millions of people who are going to become, who are going to need this care, and who are going to provide this work. And unless we own the sort of this business, unless we sort of put quality jobs and quality care at the center of that, we, we really stand a chance to, to, to not win. And so it's that's a big responsibility, but I think it's one that we're that we're up to. But it is really a responsibility that we have. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about because there's nothing way to start a morning than to talk about statistics. Um, <laughs> because there you go. And for folks who can see, this is an airplane um, crashing into uh, an aircraft carrier during World War II. And, uh, and the reason I, I put this up is that 
in the beginning of World War I, when we started having an Air Force, uh, they needed to build um, specs to make these planes. And so what the Air Force did was they measured, they said only men can be a pilot. So they took all these men and they measured their arm length and their chest circumference and their height, and they figured out what the average person was. And that's when we have small, medium, large, and extra large shirt sizes. That comes from work that was done in the um, 19, uh, 19 teens around sort of finding out what, what, what size of cockpit should be. Um, and flying a plane was incredibly dangerous throughout the um, World War I and World War II, not because you were getting shot at, it was dangerous because you were getting shot at, but it was also dangerous because planes just crashed all the time and terrible things happened. It was, it was, it was really, really quite dangerous. And in 1952, uh, a statistician said, Wait, you know, let's look at what these people, let's look at pilots, are these pilots dying? And so he, he measured around 4,000 pilots and you know, he looked, measured their, their arm length and their chest circumference and their height and said, what percentage of these folks are um, sort of fit the average, right? So what percentage of the people, like actual pilots, sort of fit the average of these three things that we've designed our cockpit around? And anybody have a guess on what percentage of the pilots fit the average? 10. 10? 30. 30? 5. Five. Zero. <laughs> Not a single person fit the average. Right? There is no average person. Which is another way of saying, like, as you as I sort of give go through statistics, right? We're gonna talk a lot about sort of averages, and we're gonna talk a lot about sort of what the um, uh, what what sort of you know trends are and things like that. The reality in your market is not necessarily reflected in the average, right? That the, 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 the best knowledge that you can have is the knowledge that you have in the local marketplace. And so I spend my time doing business analysis, and I think it's incredibly valuable. We've had last year we worked with Cooperative Care in Wisconsin, we've provided them a lot of business analysis, and it's been, I think, helpful to them and incredibly valuable to them but just as equally valuable was the sort of actual local market <coughs> conditions and understanding of what was really happening in the real world and how that related to the work that we were doing. Um, so it's just a risk around when, we, when people say, sort of tell you a number, right? Like, the, this can happen. <laughs> <laughs> and so here's a good example of this in terms of like sort of what we just what we believe. And so this is this is talking about registered nurses, right? But in 20, early 2016, there's a report in the Atlantic about how the United States is running out of nurses because we have a nurse shortage. And then last December, the Health Resources Service Administration put out a report talking about how by 2025 we're going to have a surplus of nurses, right? <laughs> So we have a shortage and a surplus, which is great, because that makes it really easy to decide what we're going to do. Right? We're, so, so all of this is just like, there is, there's a lot of information out there, right? And it can become overwhelming and become difficult and it becomes really challenging in terms of the decisions that we're going to make as an organization. But local knowledge, right, the knowledge that exists within the firm and that is shared between the, the, the co-ops is is really going to trump all of this data, right? Because it's the, the what, what's happening in, in reality. So I'm going to talk a lot about the statistics, but I think the the sort of sharing of this information is really is really really important. And when I, about ten years ago, ICA uh, started an organization called the Alternative Staffing Alliance, which is a, a peer network of of not-for-profit staffing firms. They help people with various employment, primarily. Um, uh, people who are in prison, who are coming out of prison, who are experiencing homelessness or have a disability, um, enter the workforce, right? So these are sort of job, uh, job placement entities, um, but they use a temporary staffing model to do that um, as a way to sort of subsidize the, the workforce development costs. And it's a really, really great model. Um, and about 10 years ago, there were about seven organizations doing that work around the country. Um, and we got them all together. And we built a peer network, and they, they run this peer network, and they lead this peer network. And today, 10 years later, there are around 60 of those organizations, and they employ about 30,000 people nationally, right? And that work started in a meeting like this, with a group of people coming together 
and sharing their stories and building these real connections between real operators who understand these issues and challenges. And now, 10 years ago, when we went to the American Staffing Association and we said, you know, you should really think about how you provide services to people who are coming out of prison because that's what, you know, you're doing a terrible job. They said, we don't want to talk to you. Last year when we talked to them, we, they still kind of said, we don't, we don't want to talk to you, but, but, <laughs> but we got an audience with their board of directors and we had almost a majority, not quite a majority, of the board of directors of these staffing companies saying, yeah, we really need to rethink how we deal with this issue, right? And so now we're sort of pushing, putting pressure on, that, on the industry as a whole, right? So it's not just are we creating these sort of better companies over here, we're putting pressure on the conventional industry. And I think when, when we think about this, this group, right? Like, you gotta grow and you gotta build this group and build and 30,000 people in 10 years, 30,000 members in 10 years is not going to be bigger than that, right? Yeah. But, so that was a, that's a good story, but we, you guys should be bigger than 30,000 people in 10 years. But, um, but it's, it, there, it really is that opportunity. It is the kind of thing that you can do, and it, it's this power of this network, right? So now we're talking about statistics, but the power of the network is what you guys want to think about. Um, so the, the other thing I guess I want to get folks to think about, because I fall, in, I fall into this, this, this problem, this pattern, is, is I think we need kind of a different paradigm to think about home care, right? So, so when, when sometimes when you talk to people about home care, or, you know, what is, well, what is a home care co-op, right? A home care co-op is when you talk to Dave Hammer at ICA nine years ago when I started, it was, Home health aides providing services to Medicaid, right? Because it was cooperative home care or personal care providing Medicaid services because it was cooperative home care services in the Bronx. That was our mindset, right? Um, but that's just one element of what we're doing, right? As home care co-ops, right? We've got these different job classifications and we've got these different customers and payer sources. And when we isolate ourselves to, to sort of these little boxes, sometimes we have to do that for business reasons, right? And that makes sense. But I don't, I think it's a real mistake to limit ourselves to these pieces. Because if we do, what we're gonna, what we're gonna find is that the opportunities for sort of fundamentally changing the job are, are lost. So the reason that most home care companies working in the Medicaid space in big urban areas don't employ RNs isn't because it's not efficient. It isn't because it doesn't provide the highest level of care. And it isn't because um, uh, they sort of looked and said, this, what is the best way to do it? They, it's because you make a lot of money if you own a company that employs RNs. And if you charge your subcontractor who's providing the home health aides and the personal care aides, and you put all the risk on them, right? That's what's happening, right? The risk is getting put on the smallest companies, the companies that are providing the, sort of, you know, the, the bulk of the work, right? And so the work that's happening, I don't know if folks are familiar with, with um, SCIU in California started a licensed vocational nurse um, co-op, and my first reaction to that was like, I'm sort of like, what? Is that a good idea? Like LVNs, who's doing LVN? LVNs is shrinking. But then I was like, no, wait a minute. That's, that's this sort of dumb way to think about it. Like, that's the old way to think about it. Like, we need to think about sort of home care, not just being these jobs, right? But being this whole element of care, right? And that co-ops and the workers owning that care, that's the way we change the system. And so this is just sort of a call to think big, right? And, and, and while you think big, act smart. And so sometimes, Tim Palmer has done some work in uh, Denver, working with a group in Denver. Are folks from Denver here? Oh, yeah, so he's done this work with Denver. And, and one of the things that they, that they found was that um, sort of thinking about kind of starting in the, um, uh, you know, sort of, sort of modeling on sort of the franchise model, they start in this, this, this sort of the, the home health aid, personal care, and then they sort of transition into the um, sort of more skilled care, right? And so that's a really interesting 
kind of model to think about, right? But it's one that I think we don't, as a lot of home care folks, sort of limit that opportunity. And I'm not saying we should do that first or that in certain markets it's a right approach, right? So I would probably urge against CHCA from thinking about sort of trying to take on the visiting, you know, the VNA in, in New York City. That's a, that's a big task, right? And that's not probably unlikely to happen and they're your biggest, one of the biggest customers. So uh, it's, it's sort of re matching the sort of business reality, but making sure we don't lose sight of, of sort of transforming the industry. And the industry is really designed by care caretakers, right? Um, uh, so that's just sort of my sort of pitch on sort of paradigm shift. Sort of a key takeaway from today, I would say, is you've got lots of people coming at you, so scale is important. Stability is important. Because if you don't have stability, it's really difficult to fend off the next person who's coming in um, right behind you, right? And they're coming, and they're going to. This is this number is going to go up. It's not going to go down. Um, so this is some data from PHI. Folks familiar with the, the PHI report on um, uh, the home care, the home care workforce. So there's who's not familiar with the PHI report on the home care workforce. Raise hands up high. It's okay. Okay. So all of you should go to phinational.org and download this report on the, the work the home care workforce because it's really great. It, there's, there is fantastic data out there from our allies, from people who care about the quality of these jobs, right? And they can really provide real valuable information and context and, and, and so the, the context here is between 2014 and 2024, so the next, well, not the next 10 years, but the next eight or next uh, 20 years, uh, um, you can see home care workers is the biggest um, occupation, uh, occupational growth sector in the United States, right? So this is where job growth is happening. And that it's really about half of that is personal care aids, a little bit less than that is home health aids, right? So this is sort of just sort of like, there's huge growth in the number of people entering the market, and there's going to be huge growth in the number of um, uh, jobs that are necessary. And, and as the, the PHI report uh, makes, uh, makes the case, this number actually may be understating the growth, right? Because of the, the way that they do the methodology. Uh, and so, there's really good information out there that's free from our allies. I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about money that's behind a paywall that you have to pay again. So the question is, why would you spend $300 for this, this home care benchmarking study? Um, and so this is the benchmarking study from the, it's affiliated with the, the, um, the Home Care Association of America. So who's, who's a member of their trade association? All right. Who thinks it's a bad idea to of, to join your trade association. Anybody? <laughs> so for folks who are not members, but who haven't joined, why haven't you joined your trade association? Anybody? I don't know who's an actual home care operator, so I can't call on people. But <laughs> why haven't you joined? Yeah. Just haven't thought about it yet. Okay, shouldn't thought about it. Any other reasons why? Information. To, that's the reason to join, right? Why not to join? Oh, why not? Yeah. So it costs money, and I don't know, maybe the information is worthwhile, maybe it's not. Um, oh, yeah. One reason not to join it is because they, um, they were the, uh, they instigated a lawsuit against the Department of Labor to, um, not in state the FSLA Act of yes. We found that by spending the three hundred dollars and reading the report very thoroughly. <laughs> the trade associations' views on workers are deplorable. They're disgusting. They also are the places where a lot of the best information around what is happening in the industry 
it, where it's happening. So I'm going to show a, a slide later on sort of the biggest threats to the home care industry, and that's workers. Right? <laughs> um, the, the industry thinks workers are a threat, right? And the industry does not care about workers. The industry thinks workers, and this isn't true of every person in the industry, right? There are wonderful people in this industry, like genuinely, truly wonderful people in this industry. But on, on the whole, the industry thinks these, the workers are this sort of just like commodity to be, you know, as much value to be extracted from as possible, right? Um, and if they were to rank like what, I mean, this is sort of maybe a little unfair, but if you were to rank like what do they care about most, right? It's like, well, it's, if on a list of who to rank like three things like money, the caregiver, or the, the, the client, or the caregiver, right? Like caregivers definitely be on the bottom of that list. Um, and money might play, take like first, second, and third place. Um, these are not necessarily your friends, but they, the bad guys have information. And that information can be useful and it can be valuable. Um, and so we should not. Um, we should figure out how to work in that space as much as possible um, because it is, it is a really, um, there is a lot of, of, of value, value there. Um, so the, these charts are all stolen from this, um, that report, which you can buy online for $300, and I'm not allowed to share it with anyone. So this is sort of looking at the, the median revenue. So this is the private duty. So this is like sort of the, the, the personal care aid, home health aid, private duty industry. So it's not, um, uh, it's not necessarily, everybody in this, in this room isn't necessarily sort of captured by this, but it's the closest thing to everybody. So, and, it's, and it's actually really sort of rich with data, so I'm trying to focus on it. Um, but what we see is that revenue is going up, right? So average revenue is going up over the last few years. Um, to around 1.6 million dollars, right? So if you're in New York, you're looking, what the? That's not anywhere near where you need to be, right? 1.6 million is way, way, way too low, right? In New York City to, to, to survive, right? But in most of the rest of the country, this is a number that is in sort of out, outlandish for a, for a home care company. Um, as we're thinking about growth, as we're thinking about sort of benchmarking our growth, especially for the startup folks, right? If we're not at, and this is our experience in the alternative staffing world, if, if we're not, if you're not at that, this sort of minimal threshold by year three or year four, you've got, you're gonna have problems in year five, seven, nine, right? Um, if you make it to nine. So these are benchmarks that we should be thinking about as sort of objectives to get to. So if there's not a path to $1.6 million of revenue in your future, then we gotta figure out how to get there. Right, um, and it should probably be higher than that. Yeah. I just wondered, is this their numbers? Because it doesn't yeah. quite correlate to your other slide that showed all this growth in under twenty employee um, organizations. So, what what do you think about that? I mean, right. So this is so this isn't just their members, but it's people who responded to their survey. Right. So it's about five hundred um, home care companies. Uh, and so it's not going to be a lot of the new entrants, right? right? Um, there is some data on sort of the, the, the um, in the full report on sort of revenue by years, like how long they've been in operation, and, and these newer companies are much are much smaller. But but you're saying that those newer companies need to get to this, right? Yes. Okay. Right. Um, and when they talk about their leaders, they talk about firms with 2.6 million dollars of revenue. That's the companies that they look at and say these are the leaders in the industry. Right? So is that, right, is that a plane crash? Right? Maybe it's not the right uh, you know, parallel to make, um, but it could be. Right? And so I want to make sure that folks are sort of thinking like $2.6 million is a number that we should have in our head. Right? And if, what's our path to $2.6 million in revenue? And if it's impossible or it's not part of what your plan is and you've got a plan that doesn't require that fund, but if you're competing with, if your competitors or folks are making $2 million in revenue and you're at $1 million in revenue, they are in a better position to weather a storm and there's going to be storms, right? Um, so this is just some data around, um, uh, and this is really just like background, like just so folks have this, right? Like this data is out there and we should be thinking about this stuff. 
Um, so there's not a lot of analysis on my side of this. It's just like this is information we should be thinking about in terms of benchmarking out what we do as, as businesses. Um, but you can sort of see, I mean, one of the things that's interesting is that you look at sort of the 2012 to 2015, the sort of the, the rates, the way the rates are going, they're not going up at the same rate that that revenue is going up, right? So, uh, which isn't to say that that money's going into, into the owner's pockets, but it is to say that the, the revenues are not necessarily keeping pace with uh, sort of the increase in, or the rates are not necessarily keeping pace with the, the case of, of, of revenues and that workers aren't necessarily getting that. Um, so this is sort of the threat. This is what I'm talking about, like, the workers are the threat. So when we, so, so this is, uh, I don't have the years in here, but the green is, is it's, these are the last three years, so green, blue, orange are the last three years. Um, and you can see the biggest threat that people identify is caregiver shortages, right? Um, the second one being that workers are finally sticking up and saying, damn it, we deserve a living wage, right? Like, it's sort of crazy that, that, that so many of these companies look at that, and I get it, it's hard, like it's hard to, to raise wages, right, if you're a business. It's hard for co-op to raise wages, right? And this is the part of the work we've done with co-op and care. How do we raise the wages to a way that it, it, it feels good? And they're not there yet, right? It's like, this is hard, it's really hard to raise wages. So I'm not saying it's not a legitimate risk or a legitimate, legitimate challenge. Um, the way they characterize it is a little insulting, but, um, but these are the challenges that people are identifying. Um, interestingly, the Affordable Care Act isn't the, the biggest, you know, isn't as big a challenge as, 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 as a shortage, right? And this is sort of a theme that you'll find is that it's, it's, about, it's about recruitment, it's about retention. Um, these are the other, these is care, turnover and not enough referrals are sort of behind those other areas. Um, so this is just some interesting data that, that around sort of how people are dealing with the Affordable Care Act. And what is interesting to me about this chart is this middle one here is that they're keeping the majority of my employees to 30 hours or less per week, right? We're just gonna keep people so that we're not filling that up, like we don't hit that threshold of having to provide health insurance. That's a reality that doesn't work, right? Fewer and fewer companies are finding that they can actually do that because lo and behold, there's a caregiver shortage, right? And so keeping people below 30 hours every week is, is oftentimes not a reality for a lot of these companies. Um, the, you know, I, I think it's really important that we're really, co-ops have an obligation, right? We're member run, our boards have an obligation to be the best, right? If we wanna be the best jobs, we need to have the best leadership. And the best leadership is paying attention to this stuff, right? So if you're a board member, you need to spend a little bit of time every year being nerdy and reading industry reports and coming to, you know, sitting in on these webinars and reading these things because we, we want to, we need to be smarter than our competition because the competition is spending a lot of time looking at the data. Um, and and making these decisions and sometimes they lose like the the Port Townsend folks it's like a great example of like the you know the, the your ability to take that that those private pay clients right that's really exciting right but their short term answer of like we'll raise rates to to figure out that's that's not going to work in the long run for them right that's going that's going to be a problem um, but they're going to figure out. Like they're going to respond to this issue, and they're, maybe maybe you'll continue to win there, but they're going to respond, right? And so making sure that we're ready to respond to you know the um, the, the, the sort of conventional competition is really critical. Um, so this slide is just a piece of information, just so folks have. I, I put it there just so folks have it. Um, uh, the, so don't worry about the, the the detail, but it's just sort of where people are getting. Um, doing recruitment, right? And so you can see it's it's Craigslist, Indeed, referrals, and mycajobs.com. Those are the places that the, the, these private duty nurse home care system groups are, are, are getting their their clients, right? Um, there's a there's a slide later that sort of talks about sort of the value of these different um, pieces, but um, so this is just looking at 
training, right? So it's the this is the seventh, this is the 75th percentile, which means if you're in this category, if you provide eight hours of orientation and training, initial orientation and training, you provide more training than 75% of the rest of the industry, right? So 75% of the industry is providing between eight and 24 hours of orientation um, and training to their, um, uh, to their caregivers, right? Um, so we want to be in this space, right? We want to be the best. Um, and there's real value to this. We talk about turnover later. You're going to see there's a relationship between training and turnover. Um, uh, these are just the places that people get training. I put it up there so folks have it for later. Um, so this is looking at turnover. So turnover over the last two years. And so this is from 2011 to 2015. You can see industry-wide it's around 60% uh, last year, which is a little bit of a drop from 61% um, or 62% than the year previous. Um, I think that probably the differences there are not hugely important. Um, generally, this is a sign. So when people think about turnover, oftentimes they think like about the sort of what are we doing wrong, or what's what's the problem, or why do we have this, why do we have turnover? If you're a caregiver, this is a good chart, right? This is a great chart for caregivers. Anybody have a sense of why it's a good chart? High higher turnover is good if you're if you're a caregiver. More jobs available. More jobs available. In 2011, if you worked at a lousy home care company, what are you going to do, right? The economy is lousy. What are we going to do? The economy is slightly less lousy, and so people have the ability to make, you know, sort of these decisions, right? So if you've got a bunch of unhappy members, in 2011, those folks may have left, right? So this is a this is sort of an opportunity for um, for caregivers, but a real challenge to home care companies because turnover is expensive, right? Um, but when you look at turnover, and it's frustrating that these numbers don't exactly match the numbers before, but, but they don't. Um, when you look at turnover for folks that provide more than um, five hours of training versus less than five hours of orientation training, right? So this is if you provide less than five hours and this is if you provide five or more. That's a big difference, right? So we want to make sure, like if we if turnover is a problem for us, and we're not dealing with, we're not doing the sort of initial orientation training, we're probably having, um, you know, that's contributing to, to you know to the, to the issue. Um, so here's another piece of the, sort of the same thing: is that if you've got, let you know, more than eight hours of ongoing training. Your turnover is less than if you have uh, less than eight hours of training, right? So training reduces turnover. Turnover is expensive, so training pays dividends, right? Um, and so we should think, you know, this is one of the advantages that we have built in. Yeah. Although might there be some other issues behind that to say that if you don't put time into training your employees, you're probably not treating them well in other ways too. Right, yeah. so. right. So that's um, so. There's a there, yes. That that is that is definitely true. Um, there's, there's a relationship on, on wages as well. Yeah. So Dave, can you speak to the idea that um, we've got more baby boomers retiring? We've got shifts going on in the labor force. Um, greater demand for labor in other sectors. What's the competitiveness of this sector compared to the other next best opportunities in it? It's really hard. It's, it's, it's a, so this is the cooperative care challenge, right? So, uh, so. Well, we're competing with local gas stations <coughs> that can offer benefits and a very similar, if not a little higher, starting wage than what we do. The grocery store, we can put the grocery store, fast where they can go and get all their hours in one place. And we're driving mm -hmm. all over, you know, so it's tough. So I guess my point, and just trying to think of the dynamic nature of what's going on here, the shifting in the, in the entire labor market, 
is that it's not just enough to be competitive inside inside this sector because the other sectors are all upping their game and they may very well have greater resources to invest in improving their game faster than. So it's, it's and I don't know if you have any insights on how to play that game. Uh, be big enough so that you can you can get the economies of scale to be to have a real benefits package and a training program that is sort of qualitatively and quantitatively different and better. Um, I mean, that would be my you know my my my. You're going to hear from me, and I don't know what the right. This is one of the projects that we're hopefully going to be working with on um, uh, with that CDF in the next year. Is this notion of how do we scale home care across the entire little bit later, but how do we, what are the ways we think about scaling? And there, there's a chain model, there's a federation model where you've got a lot of co-ops together, there's a group purchasing model, but there are ways to sort of think about um, uh, scale is a, is, a, is a key critical component of that. It does make you also think back to the, that um, slide where you had the various personal care up to the nurses, that rear path is another. Stepping into a company yeah. that is good, yes. right? Yes. That like meets it's them exactly. where they're at and changes. So, so it's there's. There, I think that's exactly what. Right. Actually, the, the next slide touches on that. Somebody had another question. Though. No. Oh. I, did. I, I have a question, and you asked about ACA regarding the the Medicare Advantage Act. Yeah. Um, This is not my survey, this is the survey I okay. from somebody else. I would have asked that question. That's an important question. We should ask it, but yeah, I don't I don't have I don't have any that I think that's a really that's a really important point. Uh, uh, but on this sort of caregiver, the calling issue, right? So this is this is turnover rate by um, with the, what the sort of the most important uh, referral source for workers was, right? So so here it's or if your most important referral source is Craigslist, right? This is you got a 63% rate. If your uh, if your referral rate was indeed it was 80%, but what you can see, right? Word of mouth, reputation, it's 43%, wow. right? So this this issue, or and, and, and here it's like if it's like an employee referral, right? It's lower as well. So th there's a, a definite relationship between when the this is an argument where if people are, I mean, we have to go out to the market, we have to pull people from everywhere, right? So I'm not saying don't advertise. <laughs> but I am saying if the only way you're getting people is through advertising, right? And you're not building systems around your sort of the networks, right? That's going to impact your operational capacity as well. That's so <laughs> wages matter. Um, and so this is looking at the difference between companies that pay above the 75th percentile in um, uh, wages, so, they, so they're high paying, right? Um, so that's, they have about a 50% turnover rate versus people who pay below that 75th percentile, right? So wages play a big role, right? What is, what is the 75th? What, what, what wage number is that? I don't know what that number is. Um, uh, so, but, but it's, 
I don't know what that number is. I don't know what the numbers are. Um, but the but interesting here, this is what this is this was an interesting takeaway from the survey is that on average for every dollar per hour more you pay caregivers, it decreases average turnover by 13%. Right? Um, so that's like you gotta figure out does it make sense? Um, uh, you know, how do, can we afford it? Can we do it? But it does have an impact. Um, oh, yeah. Sometimes we need more to So, so right. So this issue of like, what is what does compensation look like? Right? Is it just your hourly wage? Is it the job quality? Is it? I mean, the other piece with with CHCA is the like a guarantee of hours. Right? That like, there's if you're gar if you're going to get thirty hours, right? At, at a lower wage, that's oftentimes more meaningful than a higher wage at. Um, you know, which is with, which went with much fewer hours. So some people don't want all those hours, right? So it's about being flexible in terms of what people want and desire. Um, so, so I think that's a really important point of how do we sort of advert, how do we like, how do we promote, or how do we <coughs> attract? <laughs> how do we attract the right people, right? We attract the right people by talking about the whole host of discussion. So, so Becky and I were talking um, last night around the sort of their recruitment and sort of their thinking about um, uh, sort of increasing the, um, the, the wage, but we're getting rid of, of what was a sort of a, a three month retention bonus, right? Because that's a really hard conversation to have with somebody. Well, no, so our starting wage is here, but after three months this happened. And then, you know, and, and then after you're there for a year, you get this kind of bonus, and see, it's all good. Well, that's a like if you're if you're talking to a stranger about that, that's a really awkward, difficult conversation, and chances are they might not like um, believe you. But if you're talking to your friend, saying, "No, I had this job, and after three months this happened, and it was great, and after a year this happened," or like, no, the wages is, you know, it's not the highest wage, you're getting more, but I've got this, I've got a retirement plan, I've got an insurance plan, I've got, you know, and, and, and for me, that makes all the difference in the world, right? Um, those conversations that people have that are like sort of real meaningful conversations, those are the, that's the way you convey this, this information. And I, what, what I want to defend people who done a lot, before we start working, so I think they're training, you know, a lot of things. Right. That's why we like almost 2,072 people right now. Right. Right. Um, so the thinking about next steps, I want to put out a, a sort of a, an idea, which is um, when last two years ago or three or four, no, four years ago, four years ago we put together a study for the National Profit of Grocery. ICA did on the sort of environmental and economic impact of um, the food co-op sector in the country. And we were able to do that because every single food co-op that's a member of the National Cooperative of Grocers submits on a quarterly basis their financial data to a company called Cometrics and that, met, that information is shared anonymously across the sector. Um, and the, the association and the individual members are able to look at that information and share it. Um, and they're able to make these sort of decisions. And, and I think one, one of the, you know, Margaret talks, uh, Margaret talks about this, there, there was this notion that in the food crop sector, if you were in a college town, you, bought, you couldn't make money in the summer, right? That it was impossible to make money in the summer if you were in a college town. Until like they looked and said, well, these guys make money in the summer, and these guys make money in the summer, but we all don't make money in the summer. What are we doing differently? Let's do what they do. And now, lo and behold, you can make money in the summer, right? Um, and, and that happened because information was shared, right? And so this, when I think about sort of this conference and the opportunity that it holds, to me, it's, it's first, it's about building a peer network so that you're sharing 
building relationships and sharing best practices and, and, and communicating and doing that. But I'm a big believer in institutions, and I'm a big believer that we can't change, um, we can't transform industries, we can't transform jobs unless we have institutions to do that. And so when I think about what we're embarking on, right, sharing information in like this sort of informal way is important, but sharing information in terms of like actual real data, right? So my gross margin is this, my, you know, uh, I mean, this is sort of, I'm gonna keep on coming back to you guys and, 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 and talk about the work we did. Um, but with cooperative care, one of the things that we did that was, was this sort of revelation was we looked at, we got really into the data, the, the details of it, but we looked at the, um, the, the hour, like the sort of per hour cost of, um, of, of mileage reimbursement over a period of years. So the state had changed it so that instead of getting three, four, five hours of care, they were getting one, two, three hours of care, right, individuals. And so even though the number of, of hours was growing, even though that the cooperative care was growing the number of hours, each um, uh, client visit was, was shorter. And it's rural, so you're driving. Mm -hmm. And the, so the cost, the hourly cost of that um, increase paying, paying people for that, the reimbursement on the, on the, on the, um, for their car was, had gone up significantly, right? This was a measure, this is an issue in, in the Bronx, right? The mileage reimbursement is not an issue there. But it is going to be an issue in, any, you know, in most of the rest of the country, right? Any place outside a major city without a good public transportation system, which in this country is everywhere. Um, uh, but New York, I guess. Um, uh, you know, that's, that's going to be an issue. So when we think about um, sort of this data, right, and be able to say, like, hey, how come my, if there was a mechanism, and it's, we're not quite there yet, we don't have enough people, and it's, but, but we're, we're, we're getting there. But if there was a mechanism where the board of cooperative care could have gone in and looked on an, like on, at their, at their semi-annual meeting and said, how, are, how is our, reimburse, our mile, cost per reimbursement, you know, mileage reimbursement increasing compared to our competitors, right? They would have seen that a year and a half ago and the changes that they need to make with negotiating with their managed care organization, right, which are now just starting, would have started a year and a half ago. And boy, wouldn't that have been a better situation to be in. <laughs> so, so, so when I'm talking about sort of our next steps and the opportunity, I, it, it, this isn't about, to me, it's not about sort of saying, oh, everybody's got to be the same, or, but, but there is a need for us to understand the ways in which we're the same, the ways in which we're different, and how we can compare ourselves to each other so that we can think about that growth. Um, because if we're not, my view on this stuff is you can only change what you measure. And so we can change outcomes, we measure training, we can change outcomes um, when we look at sort of the, the, that training, right? We can change those outcomes and we measure that training, we measure the impact that that happened, and it's substantial, right? But it's up to the companies themselves, it's up to the internal operations of the company to measure sort of the job quality components of this, right? and be able to make these comparisons and to sort of see how things are changing over time. So there's a lot of stuff I think you can do, but thinking about saying, hey, we should, this should be more than just a gathering. This should be something that we're building to change and transform this industry would be my sort of call back. So that's my presentation. Um, <laughs>